Hey everybody, welcome to the 1804 show, chapter two. I'm your host, Dollar Will, and this is another episode of 1804 History. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and um before we start this episode, y'all know what to do. Like, comment, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell, ain't hard to tell. Let's get right to it. So, I was supposed to have another history segment, but considering that today marks 57 years of Malcolm X assassination, I wanted to pay homage to the OG, to the prophet, to the one of the greatest leaders of the 20th century. Malcolm Little, and just give my thoughts about how I feel about it, you know, drop some jams, you know, drop some clues or whatever, but I just had to give this man his respect, give him his dignity, and give my thanks for inspiring me as a black man to be able to do what I do. And I just think that a lot of us don't pay homage to the OGs anymore. You know, we don't give our gratitude, our appreciation to the people that died in order for us to do the things that we do today. So for that, I thank you, Malcolm X, for inspiring me to be my own leader, to be my own man, to stand on my own two feet. So let's get started. Well, basically, you know, how I feel about the assassination, I feel that it was cowardly, you know, to shoot a man 21 times in front of his wife, in front of his children. It's 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 one of those things that's is just evil. And just the fact that, you know, all you ever wanted to do was teach us and lead us into prosperity. But for that He was gunned down like a dog. Not even a dog gets taken out like that. And and, and it's just a lot of people, man, just in this generation alone, don't really realize the impact that he had and the leadership and the charisma, the strength, the courage, to be able to do what he did every day, knowing that he was getting death threats on a daily basis. And I can't imagine what anyone would do under those type of circumstances, but yet he never folded. He stayed fearless until the end. And for that, you have no clue and to think what was in his head and the fact that he was um, a marked man for standing up for what he believed in. And did you know, um, the um, last year of his life, he was homeless. He's practically broke. He didn't have any type of income because of the fact that he was exiled from the Nation of Islam and practically was evicted from his home. And he pretty much felt betrayed because the Nation of Islam would have not been the great one of the great entities in this country if it wasn't for him. Was it for his speeches? Was it for his meetings? Was it for 
his devotion to the organization. He would have not been who he um, was without Elijah Muhammad. That's true. But he also was one of those people that was charismatic. You know, he could captivate and command a crowd just with his intelligence and his vernacular and just knowing that everything that he was saying was on point and truth to power. And a lot of people back in those days were scared to speak up, you know, speak like that in the 60s. Well, 50s and 60s, people was afraid to show confidence, to to display um, black um, intelligence, black brilliance, and black um, power. Like he was the catalyst of black power. You know, he spoke to people who just was ashamed of who they were. Like he made it cool to be black. He made it cool to be a Negro um, of stature. And back in them days, you know, there were people that was, you know, on drugs and stuff like that and prostitution and gambling and all types of stuff. But he was just one of those people that made it acceptable to embrace your blackness and and embrace your race and embrace who you are. And I commend him for that because a lot of the stuff that he said 50 years ago still resonates today. If you hear and really listen to what he was saying, it was one of those things that was upliftment. It was just remarkable to hear that from someone who was in their thirties, you know what I'm saying? And he only lived to be 39 years old. And you don't really get that nowadays from um, people who are in their thirties nowadays. You don't get leaders that was ready to put their life on the line and put themselves out there for all of us to be able to to be strong and fearless. And it's such a shame that just a lot of that stuff, man, um, we don't get taught in school. They don't teach us about Michael X in school because they feel like he was a black supremacist and he was um, just a, a bully, all types of stuff, you know, and actually going back and reading the the book and going back into watching the documentaries and going back and watching the the archives of just how he just talked to the white interviewers and the white reporters and stuff like that and, and held a lot of people accountable. But one of the things that really inspired me and touched me was the fact that he really wanted to get serious about his religion and actually took that trip to Mecca and took that prim- the, um, pilgrimage to Mecca and realized that everything that he was getting taught in America and was getting taught in Chicago, getting taught in Harlem, getting taught in Detroit was all falsified. And once he got to the Middle East and really realized that it was whites that was also Muslim, he realized that it wasn't just a black thing. It was a, a international thing, you know, all colors, universal thing. And I really, really just admire um, when people can admit that they were being used and he realized he was being manipulated and used by um, the people that, you know, made him who he was. But he never discredit or never um, lied and said that he didn't um, learn from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He said that every day that I said, Elijah Muhammad teaches us, but I stand on my own word. I stand on my own 
um, with will now. You know, I'm my own man, and I'm willing to um, settle certain differences and settle any type of wrongdoing that I did on my part. So he took a lot of accountability once he woke up and really saw that he was being a pawn. And just the fact, like, even after he was suspended by the Nation of Islam for 90 days for what he spoke about President Kennedy's assassination, he refused to be an FBI informant because they came to his house and he, um, <laughs> He was smart, you know what I'm saying? He <laughs> he knew that he was going to be, um, a, you know, trying to be used. He was going to try to be an informant. You know, they knew that. Well, he knew that they were trying to basically use his um, influences as a leader. And he recorded it. And they even offered him money. They offered him, um, if there's any way that we can get any type of dirt or any type of information out of the organization or the, your leader. We willing to have people knocked off. We willing to have people killed. And he's still in fold. He said, I wish you put this much energy into finding out who bombed that church in Birmingham about them four little girls. And then they were so mad and they left. But it's just a lot of people don't have that integrity, don't have that principle. And it's always one of our own to always finish the job. Even though like they pulled a trigger, um, it was big higher ups who allowed certain things to happen. And he was basically his dad because his dad was a follower of Marcus Garvey. His dad pretty much his family was already like um, pan-Africanist pan and he suffered pretty much the same fate as his father. It's kind of like scary when you really go back and read the story and realize how similar him and his father lives ended up because they was both assassinated. But the difference was um, his father was assassinated by Klansmen and he was assassinated by um, people from Newark. Um, three men. And what's crazy about that was um, even the people that murdered him wasn't the people that murdered him. They was framed as well. Two men served time in prison for a crime that they, they didn't commit for 20 years. And, <laughs> and they knew, you know what I'm saying? It was all documented. It was all um, public record. And nobody ever tried to, you know, get these men out of jail. Like, they needed a fallout guys, you know? And, and that just really makes me so paranoid. It makes me scared sometimes because, it's like, you know, when you speak up for um, justice and when you pretty much not afraid to tell the truth, they always would try to get to you. And they're not going to try to get to you, but they go go after your bloodline. They go after your children. They go after your grandchildren. You know what I'm saying? After they kill you off, they make sure that there's no descendants that's going to take your place. And I just explained to my people and I explained to these young people, man, like, what are you doing? You know what I'm saying? What are you doing? Like, what do you got to live for? Because all this, you know, stuff about, you know, trying to get rich and get money and buying all the designer clothes and um, drinking every day, getting high every day. Like, what is you, what is your purpose? You know, what do you got to live for? What, what are you willing to sacrifice for the cause and for the for your people, for your family? You know, you just pretty much doing what they want you to do. You know, you're not using your brain. Everybody got a brain, but they don't use their brain. 
And I'm not a perfect person, but I use my brain. I use my brain to inform, educate, and teach people. And like I said, I ain't trying to be no no um saint because shoot, who is perfect in this life? Who is perfect while you in the um the flesh? Nobody's perfect in no flesh. I don't care who you are. It's as many anti-heroes than saints, than angels. You know, I'm no different from anybody. I'm not the exception. I'm just being um that voice. And I'm just allowing God to use me just like he used everybody else that was in the Bible. You know, the people that God handpicked and chosen weren't perfect people. But like I said, I just, you know, trying to teach my people um, about these things because who else going to do it? You know what I'm saying? Who else is going to like go off that limb and just educate the youth and educate the young people? Because the young people looking at us for guidance and they looking for us for wisdom. And a lot of people don't have wisdom. You know, you got to experience some things to be able to have wisdom. And I experienced a lot in my young life. And and I feel like I have a huge responsibility to teach um, people and to do this. You know, many are called, but the chosen are few. He was chosen, even in prison, like, and I just sit back and watch the movie and <laughs> and one of the most powerful things um out of that movie in the powerful quotes is when he met Baines while in that shower scene and he was just like, you know, you can't bust out of here like the movies. Even if you get out, you're still in prison. And that made so much sense to me because everybody think you are in prison when you get booked, when you get uh, fingerprinted, and when you get um, locked in that cell. But you can be in prison just by, you know, being docile and being naive and being unaware of who you are. And I was just grateful for the transformation that I made because I've always been smart. It's just that. You know, I just didn't um, catch up. I didn't know certain things, but I learned from everybody else's mistakes. And us as black people, man, like, we got to keep our heroes remembered. We got to keep the people that died for us. Just celebrate them like you celebrate the the people who ain't contributing to the cause or contributing to the betterment of our people. And, and I said this before, like, we hurt ourselves, you know, we do our selves wrong a lot and we just let and allow things to happen. Cause that day, they all knew what was going to happen. He knew what was going to happen, but he he didn't hide. He didn't run. He didn't um <laughs> go underground. He didn't run from his fate. He accepted it. You know, they say that you never know when you're going to die, but sometimes you know when it's your time is up, you, you, you just know, you know, maybe he spoke things to two existence and maybe that he just accepted it and he wasn't going to run anymore. And that right there, I respect that when somebody who don't run from their um, demise, he knew that he had to sacrifice himself. Otherwise, it would have been worse. 
because his house got fire firebombed a week before his assassination. Could have killed him, his wife, his his daughters, and I just couldn't imagine going through that. You know, I'm not saying that I won't go through that. I wanted to go through anything for what I believe in, but it just you don't have those type of individuals anymore who's willing to die, who's willing to give up their lives and all type of variations to um, give us the assurance of a, f a better future. And we just got to stop acting like that the world evolves around us and start being there for each other, stop caring about each other. Because we live in a country where like where, where our, our protectors <laughs> is supposed to look out for us, but they to be the main ones taking us out. They take us out because of the fact that we have the ability to to make things happen. We have the ability to um, fight and to join together, but we just divide it. You know, we're not outnumbered, we're divided. You know, once you really understand that, once you really understand the chess, and it's not checkers, it's chess. They, they know and they knew how to divide us. And once upon a time ago, we was together. You know, we marched together. We um, treated each other with respect and grace and love. And now we hate we hate each other. We hate ourselves. And it was it was like that then, but it's worse now. It's worse now because we chase after things that's superficial. It's so superficial, but it's not um, benefiting anything. All it's doing is causing us to hate ourselves and hate each other and wish bad on each other. And that's something that we got to stop in our communities because um, we so quick to kill each other's dreams. Just because you don't see um, certain things happening for you or you so quick to knock somebody else's dreams down because you gave up on yours a long time ago. But we have to get out of that mindset that the world owes us something. The world don't owe you shit. The world is going to be the world, but you have to put in the work. You have to be able to learn from other people's mishaps and misfortunes and come together and just work together. You know, you have people who have those resources and the capabilities to help you, but they don't help you because they're afraid of you becoming better than them and bigger than them. And just because I'm charismatic and just because people love me and gravitate towards me doesn't make me a threat, doesn't make me anything other than just a normal man. I just have it. And some people just have it. And he had it. He had it to the point that even his own um, people, like his own like <laughs> soldiers, was hating on him. It was saying that Malcolm is getting too much press. <laughs> he, they think he's bigger than you. And you taught him everything he knew. You know, and that's just crazy. But I just love the fact that he was willing to put his own um cuz a lot of people don't understand this. Like the nation provided his home, his vehicle, his practically everything from him. So he was willing to put um his livelihood on a line to speak up about some things that was was truthful 
you know, talking about racism and going against um, the Nation of Islam and what they t- taught and their code of ethics. He actually was go- going against the grain. He was going against um, the the white supremacist structure and being able to, um, you know, speak on the police brutality and other things. And Elijah Muhammad didn't want that. Elijah Muhammad was making millions of dollars and what he was doing. So he said he didn't care about the civil rights and he didn't care about anything else but what was in his pockets. He didn't care about um, us being bombed and brutalized and terrorized and stuff like that as long as he was getting paid. And he was just like, you know, you make it making it making everything hot you know what i'm saying you need to calm down malcolm so he actually was willing to put his livelihood on the line and that's why i respect him for that but that day when he got killed no other guest speakers attended the um the service because they knew that they was going to be next. And you actually had a FBI informant, his bodyguard, who, you know, grabbed um Betty. Betty. <laughs> and, um, hey, guys, sorry about that. I just now seeing y'all comments. Thanks for watching. I appreciate you guys. Sorry, I can't see y'all comments on the camera, but I see it now. But yeah, you have Betty who hurry up and ran up there to try to perform mouth to mouth resuscitation, you know, and they grabbed her. His, um, Bodyguard Gene Roberts, you know, try to, you know, you know, save him in a way, and see if he was alive, and that's how they knew that the plot was successful. Was because Gene Roberts, um, was there and everything, and then one of the the shooters, Thomas Hare, was caught by civilians and they was, you know, beating his ass <laughs> like they were supposed to beat his ass. You know what I'm saying? And he got shot in the leg by one of Malcolm's bodyguards and he couldn't run. So they grabbed him, beat the shit out of him. And one of the shooters who actually shot him and killed them. You know, the the other shots was overkill, but the one that um, killed them was the shotgun blast to the chest. He was dead instantly from this sawing off shotgun by the name of William Bradley and everything. He the one that um, popped in front and dispersed with the crowd. And um, Thomas Hare was convicted and two other innocent people was convicted of it who didn't participate in the crime. But we have to just keep in mind that um, he was he was set up and not just he suffered, but the people that was accused of murdering him suffered as well. So we have to be careful what we believe in the media and be careful what we believe, what we see and what we hear because everything isn't what it appears to be. So we have to understand that this was a man of integrity. This was a man of leadership. 
This is one of the men that actually cared about our higher allegiance amongst black people. And he will always be one of my heroes, one of my um, favorite people of history. And he's not history, he, he's immortal. He's immortal. So that will include this episode. <laughs> Thank y'all for checking in and um, give me, giving me your thoughts, sharing your thoughts. And make sure y'all check out more episodes on my playlist, Ain't on 4 History, on a, on a YouTube channel. And make sure y'all check out um, more episodes, you know, from my other guests. I got more guests coming <laughs> to the show. But yeah, man, I just had to do it, man. I had to, even though I had a, another episode planned, I really, um, it didn't dawn on me on what today was. And since I found out what today was, I just had to pay homage to Malcolm X, man. I had to. You know what I'm saying? After 57 years, you still inspiring people. You still motivating people like myself to be strong and and don't give up on my dreams and don't give up on my purpose in life. And I just want everybody who knows him and everybody who have watched him speak and everything like that. I thank you for the bottom of my heart and to his family. I thank you all for having a good man as a father, as a protector, as a leader. Your father has helped me so much throughout my everyday life and my everyday struggle. And I just had to pay homage to him. But yeah, I'm out, guys. Like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Peace.